So Kerry, um, well, I can't think of a better place to start than with this guitar uh, that's just by your side at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, on the face of it, um, an ordinary Les Paul, ordinary-ish, but on the uh, on the other hand, an, an absolutely exceptional historic instrument. So please tell us a little bit about this, this no, guitar. Certainly, certainly historically, yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, you know, 1983 Les Paul 59 reproduction. Um, I think first and foremost, Gibson has really hit in their stride. Um, they're making great reproductions, uh, and they've, they've, they've nailed it at this point. Um, what's interesting historically is that it's the first Les Paul that uh, Mark Knopfler owned. He bought it in 84, and uh, first one he really sort of played on, and, and it turned his playing around um, on that Money for Nothing recording, which this is a guitar he used on, and his many performances of it. It's the first time we start to hear Mark Knopfler really driving the guitar, really driving the tonal quality, getting that distortion that these guitars are so famous in producing. Mm -hmm. um, distortion, but clarity. And prior to that, he was a single coil guy, and that's mostly what he's playing on. Um, he's going for that bell-like tone, and, and now he's now he's hot rotting it, basically. Yeah. So a lot hinges musically on this on this instrument. So he he acquired this in 1984. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, uh, Brothers in Arms came out the following year. I think I believe that's correct. So really, he must have been. This must have been straight into the action, as it were, with recording. Did he Did he also use it live a lot? This instrument. He did use it live a lot and performed yeah. with it quite a bit. Um, it was uh, his his touring Les Paul for, for for quite a bit of time. Yeah. So Kerry, perhaps you could. Um, if you don't mind picking the instrument up, so no. we can just sort of talk about some of the features. It's got a lovely figure in the top, is, which is actually far more apparent in the flesh than, than perhaps uh, in, in some of the pictures I've seen. It, it certainly is, and uh, and it's you know at this point in time, I, I think uh, they're picking out much flashier wood at Gibson. Yeah. Um, you can't always depend on such a, a a strongly figured top on a real fifty nine, frankly. Yeah. And I, I think sort of, I mean, perhaps we can talk about weight as well. I mean, this is this is on the sort of more substantial end of the of Les Paul weights, but still quite manageable by by the sound of it. Um, it is. It's it, it's quite a chunky guitar, and and I certainly wouldn't want to have this slung over my shoulder for uh, he's two hours on stage. I wouldn't want it for thirty minutes, quite frankly. Yeah. It, it, it's a lot of guitar. Yeah. And um, do you know what period Mark used this um, guitar? Uh, for before, yeah, I know that he actually went on to own um, original bursts and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. so what what period of his career was this guitar active um, through? Well, certainly within that point of time when um, Money for Nothing has become a great hit um, from '84 onward, um, uh, he he brings it on tour for for the better part of the next you know decade, decade and a half. Yeah. And in terms of um, the people who have been to the the viewing here. Um, you know, there, there's so many exceptional guitars. It seems churlish to, to point out one, but is this? Would you say this is a real focal point for the um, collection? It is for the fans. It's a real focal point. Um, it's the instrument that they associate that great hit with. And and there's two types of customers that are coming in here to Christie's. There's those who are just simply fans of Mark Knopfler, and then there are those who are very talented guitarists and fans of Mark Knopfler. Um, and really revere his his uh, his virtuosity. Um, that's I think probably where a guitar like this will go to is is someone who will certainly collect, um, but certainly will be playing them. And it's certainly what Mark wishes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll just say a quick word because um, it's not the only um, uh, Gibson reissue fifty nine that's in the auction. I noticed there's a beautiful one that was on display on the on the near side of the hall actually. A little bit later, a little bit later, about, yeah, in the noughties. I think, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does how do they compare? Because we're really looking at two slices of Gibson's. Gibson's kind of surveying its its own history and recreating it, really. There, aren't we? Right. Um, I, th this that other one was made almost for him, um, and he's he has two vintage um, uh, Les Pauls, uh, fifty eight and fifty nine. Um, yeah. He's decided to sell the fifty nine. Um, he's keeping the fifty eight. Oddly enough. Um, he likes the chunkier neck. Um, that 2004, which was made for him in the custom shop, uh, is billed as a 59, but it has a more 58 contour, a much yeah. more thicker, blockier neck. And that's what he likes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, he, he, he wouldn't be alone in liking the, the, the tonal authority of a thicker neck. So uh, good taste as always. Do we talk about single coils and, you know, 
hamburgers. Yeah, and, uh, yeah actually, well, I, yeah, I mean, that. do you, I'm presumably you've, you've plugged this in and have sort of had a, a listen to it. Are they particularly hot humbuckers or are they really faithful to that, that PAF thing? I don't think I'm a good judge of humbuckers, quite frankly. I'm a single coil guy <laughs> myself. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I, I love how the, um, the burst has kept its kind of redness on the edge. I, I know it's only an there's 80s a, guitar, but... So. Right, exactly. There, there's not, it, it's certainly not as much fade as one would expect. Um, I, and I, I think in, 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 uh, in 83, um, they've got these pigments down where they're, yeah. they're, they're fading less than they used to. Yeah, yep. that's right. Okay, and remarkably little wear. There's a tiny little bit of buckle rash in the back. It, 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 belt buckle wear. Um, uh, and, and you'll see this on all his guitars. Yeah. Um, a very little pick wear yeah. uh, because he's a finger picker. Yeah, right. well, there we go. It's good for the, good for the guitars as well as it the is. ears. So. It is. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's, um, let's have a look at the next guitar. So uh, as, we, as we've said, um, Almost, almost more iconic in a weird sort of way of Mark Knopfler's work is this um, this Pensasur MK1 from 1988, I believe. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little about, bit about the inception of this guitar and, and, and why it was made. Well, it, there's a wonderful backstory about this guitar. Um, first, the basic um, uh, geometry of it. Um, John Sir, great luthier, working in the workshop of Rudy Pensa, um, was working on a guitar for himself and he decided to pick out a really beautiful set of uh, um, of quilted um, american maple and uh, with a mahogany back and mm -hmm. he said i'm you know, i'm going to make this body for the first time uh, i'm going to do a carved top i mean yeah. just like a les paul um, he had that idea in his head um, bound body and he tells the story that you know he, he was really just excited about making this instrument for himself and in walked Rudy after having a breakfast with Mark um, where they had been sitting in Fritzl's coffee shop designing a guitar that would fit Mark's needs and uh, and Rudy said that's the guitar that's we have to we have, that Mark's that's got to be Mark's guitar and John said he was a bit crushed, but then very proud that he was going to be making a, another guitar from Mark Knopfler. Um, what was the vision here? What was this guitar trying to um, achieve? Uh, Mark Knopfler, as we talked about before, he's mostly a single coil player. Um, so he's playing on strats, strat copies, tellies, telecaster copies. Um, but he is now switching and using a Les Paul with fit with humbuckers. Um, he wanted a guitar that could do it both. And this is the instrument that he yeah. helped design to do it. Uh, Humbucking at the bridge, um, two single coils, um, uh, switches that are able to um, uh, make a combination so he can sound telly, he can sound strat, he can sound like a, a Les Paul. And he doesn't have to change guitars on stage. Yeah. And it's um, active pickups as well, so you know, quieter. It's got a good level of signal coming out. It it does, it does, yes. Um, and it, you know, people ask, oh, what's this? What's the deal with with the back? Why such a big back plate? What's going on? Um, it, uh, John Sir said one of the uh, one of the you know arbiters here for Mark was, you know, back in the day, you couldn't get surrounds that matched the covers. They were either white, white, or they were black. Yeah. And he didn't want that to clash. He wanted a sort of consistency here in design. And so John Sir um, set the humbugging in through the back. Yeah. 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 So that's how you access it. Um, and for lack of a better description, he said, it was a moose trying to do that, Kerry. It was hard, it was hard. Um, Another great story about it is he's got a deadline to meet before this guitar gets shipped to London. And, uh, and he's got the lacquer on. It's, you know, nitrocellulose finish, pretty standard. And he's worried about packing this guitar up and, and, and the, the lacquer not fully cured. So he shot a coat of polyester on top of it. And when I spoke to him on the phone, um, his question to me at the end was, what does it look like? I said, it looks great. He said, has it cracked? And I said, well, no. He said, well, that was his great fear. He was gonna put this hard, very, you know, 
vibrant finish on top of a relatively softer, more flexible finish. And as it cured, you were going to get a lot of what we call mm -hmm. cold checking sometime or crack of the ore on the top. And it hasn't. It, it is as good as day one. And he, 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 I wish I could have been in the room. It was on the phone. I'm sure he looked up at the ceiling, but he said to me, amazing. It's so great. So. Well, one thing I, I've noticed here, and I, I can't be sure because I'm not super, super close, but is that a one-piece top as well? It is a one-piece top. Um, and that was the other thing he couldn't remember. He said, I think that was a two-piece top because the next one he made was, and I said, no, it's, it's one piece, John. He went, oh. So, <laughs> getting this out in time to make it to Wembley um, for Mark to play uh, at uh, um, Nelson Mandela's uh, birthday concert. Um, the words John used for me was, this was his crowning achievement as a guitar maker. And that's saying something coming from John Sir, because he's, he's made a few. <laughs> he's made some spectacular instruments, no, without a doubt. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for showing this this uh, instrument. It's, it's so special. And, uh, and I think uh, probably time to look at our third third guitar. Yeah. This kind of completes our little um, trio of American guitars of the 80s, which are kind of building on earlier templates, which is like the first wave of custom, better than the original platform type thinking by right. different makers. Right. And this, so this is the uh, a red uh, Telecaster style Schecter. So tell us a little bit about this guitar. Well, um, made by Schecter Research, 1983 in uh, Venice, uh, California. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone knows the story of Schecter. Um, originally, they were making parts for people like me in my repair shop in Salt Lake City back in the 70s. Um, and, uh, and the parts that they were producing, the components, were better than what Fender was turning out at that point in time. Um, and so repairmen were taking these, taking these parts, um, and they suddenly realized we can start putting these parts together and make our own guitars. Um, uh, Schechter was selling everything from pickups to uh, potentiometers uh, to necks and bodies, and you could order different colors if you wanted. Um, this guitar was put together in the workshop of Rudy Penza uh, for Mark. Um, the first, um, first uh, Schechter, um, Tele copy that he purchased was a black one, um, spectacular instrument in 1980, and then this one followed in 83. Um, it's the guitar he uh, he penned Walk a Life on. It's the guitar that he recorded Walk a Life on. It's the guitar he performed Walk a Life on over and over again, which is certainly one of my, I, I have to say, my favorite song of his, <laughs> for the simple reason, there was a great restaurant in uh, New York in about 85, all the way down the west side on the river, and it was called the Gulf, the Gulf Coast, and they served Cajun food. And Walk of Life played on the playlist probably every hour and a half. And you know, Great tune to drink uh, long neck cold beers and, uh, and eat uh, crayfish out of a bowl. Well, it's got that kind of Louisiana kind of vibe to it, hasn't it, that song? Yeah, it definitely does. It definitely, you know, built around a, a Cajun uh, a chord progression and, uh, and, that, and the great accordion. So, yeah, terrific. I, I mean, I love this guitar. It's, it's it, it, fabulous red color. Um, I think red always trumps uh, any other color in the, oh, absolutely. In the book. Um, had a lot of use on it. You'll see a lot of crackle yore on this finish, um, a lot of uh, um, belt buckle wear on the back. Um, but tough, tough finish on here. Um, again, I think if this had been a fender, you would have lost most of it by now. Um, and is it, um, is it on ash or older, the, 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 the body? Uh, good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, the other thing that leaps out to me is, is the pickups, because they've got those, you know, thumping great pole pieces on them. So it's quite a, gonna be quite a hot guitar by looking. It's a very hot guitar, very punchy. Um, the black one and this one were the very reasons why he uh, he used them. Mm -hmm. and, and really this guitar represents um, a kind of line of thinking in guitar design, doesn't it? Look, there's the thicker frets, there's the big pole pieces, mm -hmm. there's the six saddles. Um, so this is really taking what people perceive to be, you know, it, rightly or wrongly as, as the sort of weaknesses of the traditional Fender designs and kind of making it more roadworthy, making it more right. robust. And right, and that's exactly what how he utilized this. Um, uh, its stability on the road, on the stage, was really what he embraced here. Yeah. Um, and just a last word from you on, in summary of the exhibition. I, I'm, I'm struck by, when you have songs that reach so many people as Marx did via Dire Straits and his solo work, how um, 
how, how emotive actually seeing this collection is. Uh, it was, is that your sense as well, seeing people come and look at this collection? It certainly is. I, I, I had a, this great experience in the first two days of the opening to watch people walk into the room. They can hear the music before they step in and they would get this wonderful smile painted across their faces. Um, everyone excited to be in here. And then you couldn't get them to leave. Um, there was a gentleman in here, I think it was the first day of the view. Um, he came for an hour and he spent the whole day in here. Right. Well, um, uh, there's not much time remaining before the uh, sale on the 31st, I believe, which is uh, next week as we film this. Um, but um, I, I certainly hope uh, many more people come to see it before the sale itself. And uh, these instruments will undoubtedly find very good homes. So. Yeah, it, it's not to be missed. <laughs> okay. Kerry, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This, this is great fun.